As um, we get ready to get going this morning, I want you to turn to Luke chapter 6 with me. But I want to let you know that in two weeks, we're going to be having our next baptism. So if you're here and you need to be baptized, that is November 21st will be our next baptism, two Sundays from today. So if you need to be baptized, come and talk to me about it. And um, that is always an exciting time. And so I hope that you will make that decision to follow the Lord in baptism. Uh, this The message this morning, I have entitled, Turn That Frown Upside Down. I know that's a little cliched, but uh, uh, to me it's just kind of fitting for the passage that we are dealing with today. And uh, let me just say up front that uh, the lesson of this passage, I think I need more than all of you combined. So uh, thank you in advance for indulging me as we approach this uh, passage of Scripture here in Luke. And... um, I think, uh, I know, well, I hope for me anyways, the Lord will uh, continue to speak through the passage uh, to my heart. But what we're doing as we approach this section in Luke chapter 6, we are seeing some of Luke's themes repeated, and so they seem to be coming in cycles. And the cycle involves this. There is devotion unto God. Now, I I want you to kind of make a mental note of these because as I read some of the passage here, I want you to be able to find them and identify them and draw them out of the passage. So we see devotion unto God. We see the uh, we see Jesus kind of engaging the people with their needs. So there's healing and there's deliverance from spiritual oppression. And then there is instruction. So it's pretty simple, but that's kind of a a cycle that we've seen come up over and over again. We have devotion unto God. We have the manifestation of the kingdom in the lives of the people, healing and deliverance from uh, oppression. And then we have teaching or instruction. So as Jesus comes Uh, And as we see what he is about to say in this passage, he is really uh, culminating with the teaching in which he is explaining to the people what the kingdom of God is like. And really, what Jesus is doing is he is introducing to the people something that ought to change their life or to turn their life upside down. Their approach to life is really very different than the approach that Jesus wants us to take. And I just have to warn you in advance that what we read in this passage here uh, just really goes against the grain of our sensibilities of what life is like, or at least what our hope for life is, is all about. Jesus is just going to take that and turn it upside down. And it's just hard. Luke is just a hard gospel to go through. So let me start in verse 17. And again, here are the the elements. We have devotion unto God. We have the manifestation of God's presence through healing and deliverance of spiritual oppression. And then we have instruction. So verse 17. And he came down with them and stood on a level place. Well, I am going to go back. Verse 12, sorry, I'm going to start in verse 12. This is where I meant to start. So verse 12 says, Now it came to pass in those days that he went out to the mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. And, it was, and when it was day, he called his disciples to himself. And from them he chose 12, who also he, whom he also named apostles. Simon, whom he also named Peter, and Andrew his brother, James and John, Philip and Bartholomew, Matthew and Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, called the zealot. Judas, the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who also he became a traitor. Who also became a traitor. Verse 17. And he came down with them and stood on a level place with a crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and from the sea coast of Tyre and Sidon who came to hear him and be healed of their diseases as well as those who were tormented with unclean spirits. And they were healed. And the whole multitude sought to touch him, for power went out from him and healed them all. Then he lifted up his eyes toward his disciples and said, and this is where the teaching begins. That's quite an incredible passage. Of course, we've seen already how Jesus is devoted to prayer. And so he spends the whole night in prayer. And when he comes down uh, from this time in prayer, he selects his 12 disciples who are going to be the ones who follow him around. 
And then he goes around, all, people, all the people are coming to him, and he is healing them, and he is delivering them from unclean spirits. And then in verse 19, and this is a peculiar passage here. The whole multitude sought to touch him. This is of their initiative here. They sought to touch him, for power went out from him and healed them all. Now, this is pretty remarkable. I mean, the people know that Jesus is working in an unusual way, and they need healing, and they need deliverance, and so they flock to him in order to receive these things. But as Jesus is turning their normal life upside down by by showing his power and demonstrating his power in their life, he is also going to turn their life upside down by the teaching that he gives to them. And so as we come and as we look at this teaching, there are two sections that I want to divide the next verses up into. You have verses 20 through 23 first, and in these four verses we have the four blessings, the four blessings. So let me read these verses starting In verse 20, it says, Then he lifted up his eyes towards his disciples and said, and here it is, Blessed are you poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you shall be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when men hate you, and when they exclude you and revile you you and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for indeed your reward is great in heaven. For in like manner their fathers did to the prophets. And so we have here the four blessings. There are four things. Four times Jesus says blessed. Now this word blessed is uh, not an uncommon word. It just means to be happy. It means to consider yourself privileged. It means to receive something that is favorable uh, to you. Now... uh, it's not, just a, it's not just a pleasant acknowledgement. Okay, that's nice kind of thing. It is the blessing that approaches to the level of excitement that would cause us to leap for joy. It is the, uh, the, the excitement that just kind of builds up within that lets out with a shout. That's the kind of blessedness that we're talking about here. So we're not, ta- we're not just talking about this Yeah, you know, that's nice kind of acknowledgement. We're talking about you are blessed. You are so blessed that it causes you to get so excited about it. And so we look at these things and it ought to, or Jesus wants us to be moved by it. And the things he wants us to be moved by are uh, quite contrary to what we desire, I think, as human beings living in life. So, he says, basically, in effect, with these four things, blessed are you when you are down and out. You are blessed. When you are down and out, be happy. Rejoice. Be happy when you're poor. Be happy when you're hungry. Be happy when you weep. And be happy when you're hated. That's pretty tough stuff there. Um, how many of us feel like jumping for joy when we have no money? Yes, no more money in the bank account. Yes, so happy about that. Man, I'm hungry. Woo! I don't even know how to do this next one about how do you, how do you express joy when you're crying? You know, that, that's just like, what? That's just, uh, that's just opposite. Um, paradoxical there. Be happy when you are hated. And what Jesus is saying is, again, he wants us to turn our perspective of this world on its head. Because normally the world rejoices not when they're poor, but when they're rich, and the world rejoices when they're full, and when the world rejoices when it's happy, and the world rejoices when it's liked. That's what we all kind of aspire to in our natural lives, you know, from the natural perspective of things. But true joy and happiness come to us not when we have these things from the worldly perspective. And so there's a certain joy that we can have when we lack the pleasures of the world and the comforts of the world that our lives crave. There is a, in this, poverty, if you will. There is a lack of what the world values. 
And this is intentional because Jesus doesn't want us to set our affections on what the world values. He wants us to set our affections on what he deems to be valuable. And it's different than what the world says is valuable. So where does this blessing come from? When I am poor and when I am hungry and when I weep and when I am hated, where does my blessing come from? Where does the rejoicing come from? Where does that joy so well up within me that I want to jump for joy? Well, it is, in one sense, in that there, though I experience what is negative now, there is hope for the blessing that comes to me later because of it. There is the hope and the anticipation that God, in the midst of my pain, will reverse this and bring me out of it to something greater. There is the expectation and the hope that in heaven there is a great reward for me. Now that's pretty exciting. Pain now, but glory later. I lack the things that the world has to offer, the things that my flesh craves. I lack them now, but I am offered the glories of heaven that far out overshadow anything that the earth has to offer. And so I can be rejoicing in that. And so as we look and consider this, I've got a couple of things for us to maybe try to apply and put into our lives. First one is this, do not be discouraged when bad things happen. So when you find yourself poor and when you find yourself hungry and when you find yourself weeping and when you find yourself hated, do not be discouraged when those bad things happen. Because as he tells us to rejoice when we are poor, he also tells us what we can anticipate and what we can look forward to. So we are blessed because the kingdom of God is ours. We are blessed because we can look forward to the day when we will be filled. We can rejoice now so, because one day we are going to be able to laugh freely. I can rejoice now because my reward in heaven is great. And so we don't need to be discouraged in the bad things because with each bad thing, God promises a revolution of that to some glory, some benefit, some blessing in heaven that is truly exciting and overwhelming compared to the earthly things. So there are a couple of verses here to consider. The first one is Romans chapter 15, verse 13. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, the word hope is used twice in this one verse. And hope is really critical and crucial to what is happening here. Jesus has come into this earth, and this earth is laden with sin. And we know that he came to take our sins upon himself and to pay the penalty for our sins. He died for us and he rose again in victory over sin and death. That's the heart of the gospel message, the work of Jesus. He did that for us. So now we who believe in him and who have received the forgiveness of sins and have entered into a relationship with Jesus, we have moved from the lack in this world to the hope of the, the glory to, glories to come to us in heaven. And so we, that is our hope. That, that is our anticipation. I don't have now, but I will have a whole lot more then. It is uh, like when you get a first paycheck or when you're hoping for that first paycheck. You get a new job, that paycheck is two weeks away, and the full paycheck is another two weeks away after that. You know how that, I don't know why they do it like that, right? You know, just to keep our money a little bit longer from us. And then, uh, I mean, anyway, so you start working, you put all these hours in, and you're anticipating that first paycheck because you really need it. 
and you keep on working and working, and you're wait, waiting for that next paycheck because you really need that. It's the anticipation that I am, I am uh, in the grind now. I am working hard. I am putting my hours in, but that paycheck is coming. And when that paycheck comes, I will have everything that I need. I'll have enough money uh, to pay everything that I need and to get all the things that I want, and uh, I can upgrade my lifestyle. And I'm exaggerating here because we never get enough in our paycheck, right? It's just never enough. But anyway, uh, the illustration is this. I am here in this earth. I am poor. I am weeping. I am hungry. I am hated. But Jesus has something reserved for me in heaven, and it's coming. And I will overcome this right here. And so that should be enough to get us to look past this here to what is there waiting for us. So don't be discouraged when bad things happen. Jesus said, you are blessed if you are poor. You are blessed if you are hungry. He said it. If you're poor and you're hungry, if you're weeping, and that, that's just kind of all-inclusive right there, if you are hated, you are blessed. You are so blessed, you should be happy because He's promising you the kingdom and He's promising Filling, being filled. He's promising you that you will laugh. He is promising that you have a reward in heaven. That is great. So, don't be discouraged when bad things happen. Second thing is this. Look past today to tomorrow. And again, this is the same thing. We're still talking about hope. We're talking about the promise of the blessing and deliverance that Jesus gives us out of our current situation with what he offers us tomorrow. So, look past today to tomorrow. Paul in uh, Philippians chapter 3, verse 13 expresses this. He says, Brethren, I do not count myself as having apprehended, but one thing I do, here it is, forgetting those things which are behind, and, and here's the important part, reaching forward to those things which are ahead. And so, I find myself here in the midst of this uh, poverty and hunger and weeping and hatred. I find myself here in that, in the middle of that, but I should reach forward to the glories that He has promised me. And therefore, I am blessed in that. The third thing for us to draw out of this, I think, is this. Learn to rejoice in heavenly things. And here's the hardest part. Um, we don't want to be poor now. We don't want to be weeping now. We don't want that. That hurts. It's painful for us. What we need to do as Christians, um, having been offered this great hope by Jesus, we have to learn how to take our affections off of these things that are here and set them on the things that He has offered me. Take my affections, that's the hard part, take my affections off of these things here and set them on the things that He has promised me. So that in my heart, what I really love are the things that he has put before me, that he has promised to give me when I get there into his presence. And so much so, these things should be so much a part of us that we rejoice in them now. So I am poor, but I am not sad about that. I am rejoicing because he has promised me the kingdom of heaven. And that causes me to rejoice. And now, like I said, the rejoicing is not just a, you know, just kind of a humble acknowledgement. Thank you, Lord. You have done this for me. Um, while the tears are streaking down your face, you know, you just kind of, uh, you know, that's nice. I can't wait. And it's not that. It is the rejoice and leap for joy. Verse 23 rejoice and leap for joy. Now, the leaping for joy, now that, that is, you, you can't get more mundane than that. See, this is why we need young people. If you're young, stand up a second. Now, be careful before you decide you're going to stand up. <laughs> That's not, look, Tom. All right. If you're young, you ought to stay. We need young people in the church. Why? Because the young guys are the ones who can leap. All right. Hey, hey, don't sit down. If you stood up, you got to jump up. Woo! Woo! <laughs> All of a sudden, our church is full of old bogeys, right? 
the older we get, the harder it is to jump. I was just talking with some people before church. I, you know, you get to a certain age, all you have to do is, uh, you know, turn wrong, and all of a sudden your whole back goes out of whack. It's like you're walking, and it's like, oh, you know, it's just all this pain all of a sudden. What in the world is that all about? So I was walking from my car to the hospital room, and I had my backpack on, and I had, uh, had some extra water bottles in there because we need some water in the room. So I'm walking, and I'm moving along at a, at a brisk pace. And, you know, I've never been one to be out of shape. I was always pretty, uh, I know you can't tell it from looking at me now, but, uh, you know, I always, I can't even preach without getting tired. You know, you hear me, I'm getting winded up here. It's like pathetic. Anyways, I'm, I'm uh, walking at a brisk pace from the car to the front of the hospital, and I take one step, and all of a sudden I got this pain in my back. And I couldn't move. It's like, oh my goodness, where in the world did that come from? I didn't even twist wrong. I was just going straight. And I stood there for a second, pain in my back. It's like, what, what did I do? So I tried to take a couple more steps. Nothing. I just could not, I just could not walk. So I stood there for a little while. And then I tried again and I was okay. I must have had a cramp in my back or something. I don't know. But I just could not walk after that for, for a little while there. And I didn't even do anything. Um, my wife was telling somebody not too long ago how I used to have a six-pack when I was younger. You know, in our early days of marriage. Well, that made me feel good. But then I felt bad because the way she said it was like, I don't have the six-pack anymore. <laughs> but then I got to thinking later, it's like, I still have my six-pack. It's just buried beneath the surface way beneath the surface. But uh, rejoicing, the jumping for joy, that's what it says here. It, it is a very down-to-earth expression of being really happy. And you just want, now I'm a sports fan. I like to watch football and other sports, hockey and baseball. How many of you watch the World Series it's like the people interested in baseball are, are kind of falling by the wayside these days. So we got some uh, baseball fans. But I tell you what, a touchdown is scored, a basket is made, a home run is hit. There were two grand slams in one of the championship games. That was like, that's like unheard of. All right, I'm getting excited now. But you see, that happens and what do we do? We hoop and we holler and we jump. Our team scored. It makes us really happy. There's that anticipation that builds up, and then finally when it happens, we leap out of our seats. But that's what it's saying here that we ought to have. That ought to be our response. And you've heard me say this before, but here it is, just you know, in red and white. It's words of Jesus, they're red, right? It's in red and white right there in your Bible that uh, these things, these promises of the kingdom of heaven, of being filled, of laughing, of, uh, being, of, of having a heavenly reward should so excite us that we rejoice and leap for joy over it. Praise the Lord! I have a great reward in heaven waiting for me. And so we have to learn this because it's not a natural thing. We have to learn how to rejoice in the heavenly promises that Jesus has given before us. And this is what Jesus is trying to accomplish when he is teaching the people here. So rejoice and leap for joy, for indeed your reward is great in heaven. Now that brings us to the next section here, the four woes. And these are found in verses 24 through 26. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full, for you shall hunger. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all men speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. Woe to you. Now the word woe, it's not really a word, it's more of a it's called an interjection. It's just kind of the expression. It's like, yay. It's like, boo. In uh, Greek, it's ue. Say that. Ue. Ue. That's the ue. Oh, way. Oh, my. Oh, no. It's 
So, woe to you who are rich. It's like, oh no, Lord. Oh, woe is me. I have extra money this week. Oh no. Woe to you who are full. Oh, Lord. Woe is me. I had enough food to satisfy me. Oh, no. Woe is me. Woe. Woe. Oh, woe, Lord. I laughed too much today. Woe. Woe. Everybody likes me. Oh, my. Oh, no. We want these things. We pray for these things. And Jesus says, woe are you if you have them. Now, why? What does he say that for? Surely he wants us to be happy. So many verses talk about it. Even the previous verses talked about being blessed and rejoicing. But he wants us to be happy about the right things. There's a, there was a prophecy in Deuteronomy the people who were approaching the promised land, God had promised to give them a land flowing with milk and honey. And he's promising to give them the land. And he prophesies, prophesies this in Deuteronomy <clears throat> chapter 6, verses 10 through 12. It says this, So it shall be when the Lord your God brings you into the land to give you houses full of good things. When you have eaten and are full, then beware lest you forget the Lord, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. This is, a, this, is a real, this is what Jesus is trying to convey here. It's not that he wants us to be unhappy. No, he just said he wants us to be so happy we are rejoicing in that day and leaping for joy. He wants us to experience that much joy, but he wants us to experience that much joy for the right reasons. He wants us to rejoice in the right things. And so there is the tendency that when we are full in this world that we forget the Lord. And that is evidenced when we fall upon hard times because when we fall upon hard times, then what are we doing all of a sudden? We're fasting and we're praying and we're crying out to Him and we're reading the Bible and we're doing all of these things because we're pleading for Him to deliver us. And so we exhibit in our own life, our own Christian lives, the fact that when we receive the blessings of God, we go a little lighter on our devotion to God. That's the danger that we have to be careful about. And so if we're rich and full and laughing and spoken well of, when we have these worldly blessings, we have to be careful and on guard because it is easy for those to distract us from Him. And so we find a couple of verses here. The first one is Luke chapter 12, verse 21. Um, this, this is the end of a parable that Jesus is teaching. He says, So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. So in other words, there is this danger in hoarding up or working hard for the earthly goods and neglecting being rich towards God. Because, and I think we all know this, at the end of the day, it is more important that I am rich with God than, I ha than having an extra bit of money in my bank account. There's no comparison there. We know it, and yet we work so hard. Can you imagine if you worked as hard as you did at your job, if you worked that hard, in your devotion and getting closer to God? What would be the impact upon your life? And maybe that can kind of, you know, there's nothing wrong with earning a good day, you know, wage and working hard. We're supposed to do that. Work six days. If you remember from my last message, work six days and rest one. That is the work ethic of God. So there's nothing wrong with having a job and working hard at it. But, we have to use that hard work in the earthly mundane sphere to remind us or to prompt us to pursue the things of God and to grow rich with Him. So we don't want to work for the earthly things. We want to work for the godly things. We want to lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven 
and be rich towards God. Um, we know this verse, 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So the, the point is this. Jesus is turning the life upside down. Don't set your heart on worldly things. Set your heart upon him. Philippians chapter 3, verse 8. Is a, Paul is just a... We, we studied Philippians for a little while in Sunday school not too long ago. And here's one of those verses. It says, yet indeed, this is Paul, I count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. So there is a, the loss of all things traded for the excellencies of Christ. How much greater is that? And so what, what are some things that we can learn from this? What, what do we do with the blessing? Because truly, we are all blessed here. I mean, we're not like other places in the world and other people of the world. We are blessed here. So what do we do with this blessing? Well, first of all, view your worldly pleasures and comforts as a take-it-or-leave-it kind of proposition. If I have it, praise the Lord, and if I don't have it, praise the Lord. So, so that's, uh, that's where we want to set our hearts. It's not on the worldly things. It, it, the worldly things, well, you know, give me or take it, take it away from me. It doesn't matter. My, my hope is with God. So Philippians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12 says, Not that I speak with need, in need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry both to abound and to suffer need. That's contentment. That's godly contentment. So we should be content. Take it or leave it. The second thing that we can take away from this is, is this, I think. Be thankful for every blessing. Has God blessed you? Well, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, right? Well, what a gracious God that he gives us more than we deserve. Everything we have is more than we deserve. And he has given it to us. So let's be thankful for that. Be thankful, be very thankful that you have a good and blessed and comfortable life where you have all of your needs met. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18 says, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Uh, some of you are struggling with knowing what God's will is for your life. Well, you know, here's one. Just take this verse and uh, run with it. Just be thankful. Every moment of every day, just be thankful. Give Him thanks for all of the blessings that He gives to you. Be thankful, be thankful, be thankful. After that, be generous. I, I really believe that with everything that God sends our way, we are stewards of it. Whether it's money or our time or our strength, we are stewards of these things. So, be generous. We are, we are the vessels through which these blessings should flow. So whatever I receive should flow through me. Whatever money I have should flow through me. Whatever strength I have should flow through me. Whatever time I have should flow through me. Whatever, whatever he gives to me, I should be generous. Acts 20, verse 35 says, Remember the words of the Lord Jesus, that he said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. Did you get that? It is more blessed to give than to receive. So give. Give generously of what the Lord has given to you. And then the last thing here to help us avoid the temptation to forget the Lord and to pursue the Lord, the last thing here is to ask God to help you love Him more. Um, with it, each blessing, I mean, this is a good prayer. Oh Lord, with each blessing you give me, help me to love you more. Help me to love you more with that blessing and help me to love you more with all of the blessings. Help me to love you more. Philippians 3, 8 again. He says, I count all things lost. Let me bring that up. I count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. So we should ask him for help to see the excellency of his glory, to see the excellency of knowing him, to see the greatness of gaining Christ. Let's ask him for help to love him more. 
So going back to this, uh, again, the purpose of Jesus is this. He is coming to people who are living life in this world, and Jesus has come to give true life in the world to come. And getting there requires turning our view of this world on its head and setting our affections upon him. So help uh, to rejoice in the, when we are down and out because of the promises that he gives that go beyond that. And help not to rejoice when we have these things, but to rejoice in the things that he has promised to give us. So let us come to him with that. And we will be able to rejoice in this life, looking forward to the next life. And so that's uh, the appeal to you this morning. Uh, you may be uh, struggling you need to rejoice now in your future hope, or you may be full right now in this moment of life, and you need to learn how to let that go and to set your affection upon Him. So wherever you are currently in your life, this is the time in which to get before Him and to reorient, reorient yourself along with Christ. So, Come on up here, Ben. Let's stand as we sing our final song during this time of ministry. Let's ask the Lord to move in our hearts and in our lives. If you need prayer, please come on up. I'd be glad to pray with you.